Uh, welcome to the Teach Out edition of Odd Sex. Uh, thank you all for finding your way back across the um, Atlantic Ocean um, there and back again for many of you. We've moved from uh, the University of Bristol to a non-affiliated Zoom platform out of respect for the strikes taking place in the United Kingdom at the moment. Uh, this is really important for me that this event is still going on because Odd Sex was dreamed up in response to a lot of the issues that are being fought for by the UCU Academic Union, the so-called Four Fights campaign against uh, discrimination, inclusion, precarity, um, and access. And we're here to enable all those things, except precarity, we're against that, uh, but to in increase inclusion and the diversity of voices. And so I'm really pleased that we have this opportunity today to hear from Rebecca Mitzine. And I'm gonna pass over straight to Nish Powell and take very much a back seat in today's proceedings. Thank you everyone for joining us. Nush. Thank you, Elaine. Um, and I'm going to stop admitting people and let you do that now. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I, I know that it's been a difficult winter so far for everyone for a whole smorgasbord of reasons. Um, and it's incredibly meaningful to see this community continue to come together uh, the way it has. The Odd Sex Seminar Series. Um, seeks to inspire respectful discussion, debate, and actions that will move the field of 18th century studies towards a more inclusive identity. Um, and we do this not in support of traditional institutions, but because we are full of hope for a new and, and a better future for our field. Um, and so as, as Elaine just did, I want to emphasize briefly um, this is uncompensated activity for everyone involved. Um, I'm hosting this meeting on my private Zoom account. Odd sex is not university directed or mandated, it, it is communal. Um, so it is now my very great honor to introduce Rebecca Mitzsein, Assistant Professor of English at Boston College. Uh, Rebecca holds a master's degree from Duquesne University and a doctoral degree from Purdue University, which she completed in 2016, despite what is rumored to have been extremely uh, lackadaisical advising there. She is the author of more than eight uh, published and forthcoming peer reviewed essays whose topics cover a wide range of issues from addressing structural racism in teaching the 18th century to Trans-Saharan trade routes in Orinoco to the crisis of effective kinship in Coleridge's Christabel. If you have not had the pleasure of getting to know Rebecca at a conference or through her writing, you should treat yourself. Um, a senior colleague uh, of mine once made the remark that it's, it's a discombobulating but a pleasurable moment in our careers. When we look around and we realize that we are uh, no longer a rising star or a, a bright young mind in the 18th century studies. Um, and actually that's a positive kind of a realization um, because it, it comes of the truly immense quality of the work that the bright new minds and rising stars actually are doing. Uh, and, and while I do, as I suppose many of you uh, in this room do, I do have many concerns about the future of 18th century studies. I also have a great deal of hope that comes from the abilities and the convictions of our next generation, which is a long winded way of saying uh, that Rebecca's work is riveting and her book, which is coming out soon, is going to be field altering. We should keep an eye out for it. Uh, Rebecca is ever a collegial and a thoughtful presence, and her scholarship is challenging in the best possible ways, uh, mapping and remapping Afro-European interactions, and in so doing, prying open pathways that may offer actually a viable option for retaining some sort of ethical scholarship of the Enlightenment. Her book, which will be available shortly from the University of Virginia Press, is entitled African Impressions, How African Worldviews Shaped the British Geographical Imagination Across the Early Enlightenment. The triumph of Rebecca's work is not in, or not only in, its ability to hold together both local and global ways of seeing and knowing. Rather, she unseats today's post-colonial gaze by showing that much of the West knowledge of the world was never Western at all. 
So I'm therefore pleased now to yield the floor to Professor Mitzsein, who's presenting to us today on the Queen of Sheba's Minds, African Solomonic Discourse and the European Geographical Imagination. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that lovely and flattering introduction. Um, best of dissertation advisors, the type that I wish all PhD students could have. Um, and thanks so much to Elaine at, uh, for inviting me to do this, to share my work in this forum and to all of you for turning out um, during what is a busy time of the semester and a busy time of the day for many of you um, if you're on the American side of this operation. So I'm really looking forward to sharing this research with you. This talk comes from a book that is called, as Nish said, African Impressions, and it's forthcoming from the University of Virginia Press this year. And as the book's subtitle indicates, it's about how African worlds and worldviews shaped the British imagination across the early enlightenment. And that's a temporal term that I'm using to designate the era after geographers began to aspire to empirically describe the world, but before explorers were able to gain material access to Africa's interior. Through an analysis of a range of genres, including travel narratives, geography books, maps, verse, and fiction, it tracks practices that Europeans used to represent the continent in spite of the impossibility of firsthand observation. And in particular, it emphasizes the ways that Europeans explicitly or implicitly calculated African expressions, what Africans had to say or show about themselves in their worlds, into these kinds of texts. And it demonstrates how African strategies of self-representation and European strategies for representing Africa grew increasingly entangled during this era and I call the geographical narratives that emerged from these entanglements, African impressions. I make the case for why two regions of Africa took the form that they did in the European geographical imagination and how those impressions impacted the way Britons thought and wrote about the continent as a whole. The first of these regions is the Western Sudan or land of the blacks, borrowed from Arabic geographical discourse this designation first mapped roughly over what were thought to be the territorial boundaries of the medieval and early modern Mali and Songhai empires. It was subsequently expanded by European geographers to include Nubia and the coastal states of West Africa, ending at the Kingdom of Congo, only to shrink again as Guinea took on its own set of distinct and coherent associations. The other region is Abyssinia, presumed to be the Christian kingdom of Prester John and home to the source of the Nile. And Abyssinia exerted a stunning level of influence over the ways that Europeans thought about African geography more broadly. Even though historically its territorial boundaries were fairly limited, it was thought to encompass, or at least to have encompassed at one time, as much as a fifth of the continent. And the book focuses on the Western Sudan and Abyssinia, not because they were the only regions that were of interest to European geographers or because they were the only ones that shaped European thinking about the continent, but because of all sub-Saharan regions, they have the longest history of being simultaneously known about and inaccessible to European travelers. They were known about because African elites successfully projected expressions of their sovereignty, wealth, right to power, geopolitical clout, and religious exceptionalism that entered Europe long before Europeans entered Sub-Saharan Africa, broadcast via the Trans-Sahara trade and pilgrimages to the Holy Lands. In fact, the impressions Europeans formed from these expressions motivated the first earnest attempts by European nations to gain access to the continent, fueling Europe's desire to find the sources of West Africa's gold and the city-states along the Niger, to establish a relationship with the Christian kingdom of Prester John and to discover the source of Africa's most legendary river. African impressions are not mimetic reflections of any given African place or people. As ample scholarship has by this point shown, early enlightenment representations of Africa staged racist thinking and expansionist fantasies. But African impressions are also not superficial treatments of or wholly imaginative projections onto a dark continent. 
They're the result of what I call a dynamic cycle of discursive reiteration that unfolded across hundreds of years. They not only originated through the incorporation of African expressions into European thought, travelers returned to African contact zones and geographers returned to written accounts of past encounters to evaluate whether their outstanding impressions of the continent were viable based on what they were either told by new African informants or saw again in the old record, travel writers and geographers maintained or reshaped their own representations accordingly, though not necessarily accurately and frequently in service to their own agendas. The creation and perpetuation of African impressions was ongoing in other words, and certain key notions remained at their core because Africans kept implicitly or explicitly affirming them. African impressions are therefore both intertextual and extratextual. They're intertextual in the sense that they arose from communicative events between Africans and Europeans, from erudite geographical traditions that worked across many languages in order to blend old knowledge about the continent with new knowledge, and from imaginative representations of Africa that drew from and spoke back into geographical discourse. They're extratextual in the sense that no single representation of any particular region encompasses the body of details that European thinkers and writers came to associate with that region. Yet when a critical mass of representations are examined for their patterns and consistencies, a collective entity emerges that can be described and analyzed as a coherent literary object that tells a recognizable story. Reconstructing these stories enables us to reconsider how literary texts that may initially appear to be only cursorily engaging with African worlds or projecting European fantasies onto the continent, in fact, necessarily depend upon and regularly allude to a complex transcultural representational tradition. So in my talk today, I'm going to walk through an example of some of the work that the book is doing, the role that African self-narration played in shaping the theory that the biblical city of Ophir was in Sofala, a region on the southeast coast of the continent that is now part of Mozambique. In the wake of the so-called age of discovery, Europeans strove to square their ever widening understanding of the world with a lingering belief in the historicity of the Bible. One of the holy grails of sacred geography was the location of Ophir, the city from which Solomon acquired the wealth and materials to build his temple. Other than references to some exports like gold, silver, ivory, precious stones, apes, and peacocks, the only specifics the Bible gives about Ophir is that it's a port city and that it took three years to reach it from Judea and to return again. European travelers and armchair geographers alike relied on these details and whatever other evidence they could scrape together in order to try to pin down its location. Although this may seem like an esoteric question that nobody but a theologian would care about, Europeans were not seeking the location of Ophir for purely intellectual reasons. They were also not seeking an El Dorado. They were using riches that had already been found to make cases for its location, not searching for, locate, for its location in order to find riches. Rather, geographical writers like John Dee and Samuel Purchase who sought to glorify and legitimize European expansionist agendas, harnessed its allegorical potential. As the theory went, Solomon was the first great navigator and the first lawful global power because he relied on trade rather than conquest to enrich his kingdom and build his temple. Whichever monarch succeeded in locating and establishing their own trade with his ancient partners would shine as Solomon's spiritual successor on the world stage. Thus, explorers from many Christian nations claimed to have discovered it. Christopher Columbus believed the island he would call Hispaniola was Ophir because of the gold he found there. And Benito Arias Montano made a philological argument that it was in Peru, based on a passage from Kings that said Solomon's temple was built with the gold of Parveum. Delocated it in Sumatra because of its ivory and gemstones. Abraham Ortelius, whose influence over early Enlightenment worldviews as the creator of the first modern atlas was substantial, included a cartouche and a smaller inset map in the lower left-hand corner of his Geographia Sacra, 
listing possible locations of Ophir. And he threw in his own lot with those who said that it was in Southeastern Africa. The reasoning was this, all the commodities listed in the Bible were to be found there as long as one read parrots or ostriches for peacocks. And it was reasonable that one could sail to Southeast Africa from Israel and back again in three years in a ninth century BCE ship. Voyages to the New World would take too long. Voyages to other parts of the Holy Lands and the East Indies would be too short of a trip. And large swaths of that trade were conducted by overland caravans and not by sea at all. But there was another category of evidence routinely cited for why East Africa was Ophir's most plausible location. Africa was the only possibility that met the above criteria where the inhabitants themselves affirmed a Solomonic connection. In fact, there are at least three different African narrative traditions that do so, and all three circulated in widely read early modern and 18th century geographical texts. One comes from the Highland people of Ethiopia. They have long contended that the biblical Queen of Sheba is African, and her story is the centerpiece of the Kebra Nagast, Ethiopia's mythopoetic national narrative, manuscripts of which date back at least to the 14th century. Recounting the Queen's visit to Solomon and prophesizing that Ethiopia will someday rise up as the world's most powerful Christian empire, the narrative does not simply identify the Queen of Sheba as African, it puts her at the center of the story. It gives her the name Makeda and endows her with great wisdom as well as great political and economic clout. Tamron, Makeda's royal merchant, is commissioned by Solomon to bring the materials for building his temple into Jerusalem, all of which come from, all of which come from Makeda's domains. When Tamron brings Solomon to Makeda's attention, she resolves to visit Solomon herself and judge whether he is as clever as she has heard. Makeda's story fascinated Europeans and versions of it circulated in European language texts from at least the 16th century. The Jesuit missionary Francisco Alvarez published an account of seeing the book in a church in Aksum, the presumed seat of Makeda's kingdom, and recorded a synopsis of it given to him by his hosts. A fuller account was written by an Ethiopian ambassador to Portugal, Saga Sa'ab, around the same time, and translations into English of both of these accounts were published in purchase. The Ethiopianist Heop Ludolf included a summary of the story in his Historia Ethiopica, the accuracy of which he confirmed with an Ethiopian monk named Gorgorios who came to visit him in Germany. And finally, James Bruce, who spent six years traveling in Africa, brought the first copies of the Kebra Nagast itself into Europe in 1774. Another East African narrative tradition that connects Africa with King Solomon comes from the Swahili traders who migrated into Sofala in present-day Mozambique from Kilwa in present-day Tanzania in the 12th century. Up the Buzi River, where the gold and silver were mined, these traders encountered the structures of Great Zimbabwe, a 2.8 square mile complex of freestone walls constructed by the Shona in the 11th century including a canonical tower that is 30 feet high. The impressiveness of the edifices, the fact that they were built entirely without mortar, and their proximity to the mines reminded the Swahili of stories in their books of how King Solomon wielded great power over the jinn, compelling them to build his palaces and fortresses stone by stone and to mine precious metals and gems on his behalf. They determined the great Zimbabwe was built by Solomon giving rise to the commonly held idea in Islamic texts that East Africa was the source of King Solomon's wealth. Europeans knew about this narrative tradition from what the Swahili traders told Portuguese travelers in the 16th and 17th centuries. In 1502, the Portuguese traveler Thomas Lopez arrived in Sofala. He reported that the Moorish merchants were telling us that in Sofala there is a wonderfully rich mine to which as they find in their books, King Solomon used to send every three years to draw an infinite quantity of gold. When Joe de Santos sought to confirm Lopez's account at the end of the 16th century, he was told by local inhabitants of Sofala that the freestone walls up the river, a location they call Fura, was built by devils. There was mysterious writing on the entryways to the mines, the Swahili told him, 
indicating they once belonged to an ancient civilization. In fact, references to these books and this mysterious writing, evidence that was ineluctably local rather than generic details that could describe many places, was what swayed Ortelius away from arguments that Ofer was to be found in Peru or Indonesia. A third East African narrative tradition that locates Ofer near Sofala comes from the Lemba, a Bantu speaking ethnic group local to Southeast Africa who claim a Semitic origin. According to their oral traditions, they originate from the land of Sheba, though unlike the Ethiopian Highlanders, they locate Sheba's capital on the Arabian Peninsula. They traveled to Africa in order to set up trading posts along the coast thousands of years ago. And some say they were passengers on the ships that King Solomon sent from Israel to Ophir. They stayed in Africa in order to work as traders. And when war broke out in their country of origin and they could not return, they took African wives and settled permanently. Just as the Swahili traders told Portuguese travelers that the mines belonged to King Solomon, Santos cites a tradition of the natives that the mines and the freestone structures up the river from Sofala belonged to either Solomon or the Queen of Sheba. In the 18th century, Josiah Burchett similarly pointed to accounts of inhabitants of the region as evidence for locating Ofer near Sofala. They're not Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, but their oral histories prove them to be of the race of Abraham. And thus Burchett deems them doubtless the descendants of some of the Hebrews who either settled there or suffered shipwrecks in the time of this intercourse between Judea and those countries. Both Santos and Burchett identify these locals as distinct from the Muslim Swahili. Ethiopian Swahili and Lemba claims to a Solomonic past are all examples of public discourses intentionally projected by Africans about themselves and their worlds to outsiders. They were the language of imperialism and religious superiority, and also the language of diplomacy and trade. Europeans interpreted all three of them in order to form comprehensive impressions about the continent's history and geography in ways that stretched and morphed them, but also perpetuated them and depended on the credibility of their essentials. For instance, Joe de Barros, the Portuguese historian who compiled and synthesized many early modern Portuguese travel accounts in his decades of Asia, advocated for locating Ofer in East Africa based on the local testimony that was described above, on Saga Zaab's writings, and perhaps even on interviews with the ambassador himself, and on another type of African expression that's nested within this discourse of evidence. Noting the impressiveness and the similarities between Swahili descriptions of the ruins of Great Zimbabwe and Ethiopian and European descriptions of the ruins of Aksum, the presumed seat of Makeda's empire, he put forth the notion that not only were Solomon's mines to be found in southeastern Africa as the locals say, but the Makeda's domains must have stretched nearly the length of the East Coast. And James Bruce was similarly persuaded that Makeda's empire had encompassed Sofala pointing to what he saw as consensus among various African sources as evidence for these historical and geographical claims. The inhabitants of the continent and of the peninsula of Arabia opposite to it of all denominations agree, he insists, that Africa was the royal seat of the Queen of Saba, famous in ecclesiastical histories for her journey to Jerusalem. They also agree that the mines of Abyssinia belonged to her and were erected at the place of her residence and that all the gold, silver, and perfumes came from her kingdom of Sofala, which was Ophir, and which reached from thence to Azab upon the borders of the Red Sea along the coast of the Indian Ocean. Neither Barris nor Bruce produced what we would now consider an accurate account of the history of Southeastern Africa. They interpreted the expressions of exceptionalism and imperial power projected by the Shona ruins of Great Zimbabwe whose Solomonic connections were fabricated by the Swahili through the lens of what the Abisha said about Makeda's Solomonic connections and geopolitical reach, then using Swahili and Lemba accounts as further justification. They fit a great swath of East Africa into pre-existing European ideas of sacred geography. Each also interpreted the available evidence to, to excuse me, each also interpreted the available evidence to suit Portugal's and Britain's respective geopolitical interests, 
participating in a long literary tradition of both idealizing imperial expansion and making it appear not only inevitable, but divinely ordained. But appropriations don't erase the African expressions that comprise these impressions from history, nor do Barros or Bruce or Ortelius for that matter, obscure them from their texts. They draw explicit attention to their dependence upon them. They not only considered what Africans had to say and show about themselves and their worlds to be legitimate geographical evidence, they maintained and reiterated their African origins and had a vested interest in preserving as much of the local particulars of the expressions as possible because these African origins and striking details are what lent the statements credibility in the absence of firsthand observation. And all three lean heavily on the fact that these narratives continue to be confirmed in contact zones between Africans and Europeans because it was a living discourse reiterated within Abisha, Swahili, and Lemba narrative traditions independent of European interest in the story. All three of these types of repetition, internally within African cultures, in contact zones between Africans and Europeans, and across European texts, make up the engine that gave African impressions not only their substance, but also their animation, energy, and literary appeal. African impressions transcended geographical genres. Literary texts participated in the cycle of discursive reiteration as well. I argue in the book that authors of literary or hypothetical representations of Africa put impressions to imaginative and aesthetic use, but they did so in ways that preserved rather than obscured their most striking and enduring elements, which infiltrated the settings, characters, plots, intellectual investigations, social commentary, and form of early enlightenment poetry, prose, and plays from the obscure to the canonical. A brief consideration of how the Sofala Ofer impression surfaces in John Milton's Paradise Lost, Thomas Hayrick's The Submarine Voyage, and John Dyer's The Fleece illustrates this. As was the case with the geographical writing above, these poems are not mirrors of African discourse, but each nevertheless depends on and affirms Abisha, Swahili, and Lemba ideas about the continent's history and geography. Furthermore, each poem emphasizes different local particulars of the Sofala Ofer impression, with little to no explanation of what those details refer back to, indicating that not only were their authors drawing from a larger extra textual impression of Eastern Africa themselves, they anticipated their readers would make the same connections, which are necessary connections for experiencing the poem's broader spatial and temporal effects and comprehending the nuances of their global commentary. So for, in so for instance, in Paradise Lost, when Archangel Michael takes Adam onto the highest hill in paradise to show him the future of mankind and all earth's kingdoms and their glory, they look down onto an Africa segmented into four broad quadrants, East Africa, Southwest Africa, North Africa and the Western Sudan. And each quadrant is emblemized through its most recognizable associations. Adam's eye is immediately drawn to East Africa first, specifically to Abyssinia, nor could his eye not ken the empire of Negus to his utmost port Erkoko, and the less maritime kings Mombasa and Kilwa and Malind, and Sofala thought Ofer. At first glance, this pithy bit might appear to be only a list of names called from a geography book like Peter Halen's Cosmography or a mirror of a map like Ortelius is here. But considered within the Sofala over impression described above, it becomes apparent that the spatial grammar of these lines was shaped by African ways of imagining and talking about Africa. The quadrant's anchor point, in fact, the anchor point for the entire continent since it's mentioned first, is not identified through a place name, but through a person. The Negus, emperor of Abyssinia and direct descendant, or so the Cabernet says, from Sheba and Solomon. And indeed, Abyssinia enjoys the kind of exceptionalism described here as in its own founding myth. Adam's eye can't resist being drawn straight to it. And it's characterized through the language of expanse, stretching to the utmost, uh, the utmost port, which unequivocally belongs to the Negus. It is his, not simply a place that happens to fall within Abyssinia's boundaries. He is an individual and an actant, unlike the less maritime kings, who are denoted only by the name of the place they occupy, 
The sense of spatial expansion in these lines is reiterated in the enjambment between Port and Aarakocco, and by the fact that the reader is being asked to think up geographically while simultaneously reading down the poem toward the south. These states below Abyssinia are mentioned in passing as if they're merely stopover points for the ship sailing past them before arriving in another Solomonic space, affirmed through Swahili and Lemba expressions, so follow thought over. These Solomonic bookends create a geographical unit, a stand-in for East Africa in general, comprised through narrative layers that both dovetail with African impressions and valorize the expressions that upheld them, ones that Milton apparently expected his readers to be familiar with, since he deploys an African word, negus, as a metonym for Abyssinia, rather than ever naming the country, assuming that we will immediately orient ourselves by it as Adam does. In their respective poetic mappings of Africa, Hayrick and Dyer imitate Milton, playing off the lines so follow thought over, but they each foreground aspects of the impression that Milton did not include, indicating that they too held a comprehensive narrative of the region in their geographical imaginations, which they too anticipated that their readers would share. The submarine voyage gives an overview of Africa from a different angle than Paradise Lost. Its narrator has been transformed by Neptune into a dolphin who meditates as he swims through the seas on England's imperial potential. Off the coast of East Africa, in the tract that Solomon's ships did pass, his course to Sofala did hold, by wise men thought the over of old and yet renowned for gold, whose minds even admiration do surpass, whose buildings yet do ancient greatness bear, engraved with many an antique character. Hayrick's variation on Milton likewise connects Southeastern Africa to Solomon, but he highlights the Swahili and Lemba contributions to the impression that Sofala was over rather than the Abyssinian contributions focusing on the ruins of Great Zimbabwe and specifically the mysterious writing engraved on the works that Swahili traders offered as proof that they once belonged to an ancient civilization. As was the case with Milton's reference to the Negus, there's no explanation of these antique characters, only an implicit expectation that the reader will recognize them. If Milton's citation of the Ofer Sofala impression relies on spatial expansion as a poetic effect, Hayrick generates a sense of temporal expansion, establishing an ancient imperial foundation from which to imagine Britain's own potential future. The region's ancient greatness lingers in the location as potential waiting to be reactivated, sealed by the enduring promise of the words that mark it as a privileged place in sacred history. The fleece, which sketches out John Dyer's vision of England's wool trade and knitting the rest of the world together in commerce, offers yet another variation on this poetic engagement with East African geography. The speaker describes Sofala thought over from the deck of a ship, speculating that in Sofala's hills, even yet some portion of its ancient wealth remains and sparkles in the yellow sand of its clear streams, though unregarded now, Ofer's more rich are found. He then frames the whole region as if it were itself the opulent temple that its raw resources once allegedly comprised. The flat sea shines like yellow gold fused in the fire or like the marble floor of some old temple wide. But where so wide in older later time, its marble floor did ever temple boast as this, which here spreads its bright level many a league around. As solemn distance its pillars rise, so falls blue rocks, Mozambique's palmy steeps, and lofty Madagascar's glittering shores. Though Dyer also borrows Milton's So Fala Thought Over, like Hayrick, he is more focused on the southern half of the impression, and he is the um, only one of the three to connect the region not only to Solomon himself, but to the construction of his temple explicitly, which is a microcosm of the resources the region has to offer, the implication presumably being that Ofer is more rich will be found if Britain invests in the global trade. Solomon's temple, even in all its greatness, is only a model or a replica of the real deal. Thus, it is recreatable, even made better, echoing the common notion that Christian efforts were always an improvement over Jewish prototypes. Surely not every reader made the Solomonic connections that Milton, Hayrick, and Dyer's poems invite, but considering them together does suggest a certain widespread cultural familiarity 
with the specifics of the Sofala overimpression. And while the global visions of Milton, Hayrick, and Dyer's poems um, advance, while the, excuse me, while the global visions that Milton, Hayrick's, and Dyer's poems advance certainly don't hinge on the Sofala overimpression, its invocation serves a powerful purpose. As three poems that point to past empires to imagine Britain's future, their deployment of this Solomonic imagery is in line with the arguments seen in Purchase and D that Solomon was the Ur example of a lawful navigator, relying on trade rather than conquest to acquire his wealth, and that to be his successor in spirit was to be his successor in fact. The poems are thus appropriating African discourses in service to British global visions, but the impact of these discourses on the poems is also a testament to their signifying power and their lingering epistemological weight. The most salient details of the above lines, the ones that make East Africa a specifically identifiable place and not merely a vague elsewhere, are the details traceable to Africa's own Solomonic mythology. Their citation allows Milton, Hayrick, and Dyer to do something poetically, something beyond merely listing locations that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Thus, these examples also show that African expressions connect European texts with African worlds, not simply by a string of associations, but aesthetically and formally. And herein lies one of the literary stakes of the book project. In the past two or three decades, one of the main objectives of literary scholars who study early modern and 18th century global relations of power has been to devise methods for calculating the agency and capacity for resistance of Europe's others into analyses of even imaginative literature, even by authors who never set foot outside of Europe. These approaches usually entail analyzing a work with a simultaneous awareness of the dominant view that the text narrates and the other experiences and histories at play that made the dominant discourse possible, taking into account how what was excluded, suppressed, or left implied might be as much a part of the text as what was included. However, it's often taken as a given in these readings that the more imaginative a text is, the more literary it is, the farther it moves from the moment of encounter, and thus the less probable it is that it retained any element of that encounter. Thus, the fact that early enlightenment representations of Africa are often speculative, romantic, allegorical, rhetorical, or figurative has long been considered a reliable indicator that Europeans were indulging in invention, the continent and its inhabitants transfigured by the author into a set of symbols to serve a larger aesthetic, narrative, or political purpose. But recognizing that African discourse could be speculative, romantic, allegorical, rhetorical or figurative, in other words, considering how Africans transformed themselves and their worlds into symbols to serve their own purposes first, gives literary scholars an avenue to consider its relationship to European texts beyond how well European texts pass positivist tests of historical, anthropological, or geographical accuracy. As the Sofala Ofer impression shows, African impressions were certainly governed by and reiterated imperial idioms. But scholars have also long recognized that part of dismantling the narrative of epistemological dominance and historical and geographical centrality that Europe tells about itself involves showing how these global ideas have always been local. A crucial part of this work is showing how the epistemologies of Europe's others didn't simply exist alongside of or as appropriated ingredients of European worldviews, but how they made meaning in their own right and on their own terms through their explanatory potential, intellectual traction, and imaginative power. So I am very happy to um, answer questions about the book itself, but I'm also interested in hearing thoughts on where to go from here. Uh, these are three things that I wanted to grapple with in the book and couldn't. One of those is sorting through competing discourses about Africa. So the book resists reading Hegel's declaration that Africa had no history and the blank map that Marlowe hankers over in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness back onto early enlightenment representations of Africa. And this is in part because such readings have tended to repeat rather than dismantle these assumptions in key ways. But groundwork is simultaneously being laid 
in the geographical imagination in the early enlightenment to make these ideas thinkable. Likewise, as the Atlantic becomes an increasingly central geographical organizing principle, ideas about Africa take their own shape in early Caribbean and American texts. And Africa begins to on its own, um, excuse me, Africa begins to take on its own set of associations in the Anglo-African literary tradition during this time as a longed for left behind homeland and a rallying point for a unified black identity. Geographical representations of the continent are also being shaped by abolitionist agendas in ways that tend to emphasize African innocence and noble savagery and de-emphasize the ways that Africans were drivers of economic um, and geopolitical realities. So I wonder, do these competing discourses stack? Do they cancel each other out? Get blended into their own configurations, exist independently from one another? How can looking at these different representational traditions together shed light on one another? A second question worth grappling with, how to talk about African empire. The African expressions considered through the book are imperialist discourses that shouldn't be romanticized in the interest of telling a triumphalist narrative of black life on the world stage. Many African nations negotiate the long arm of these power dynamics simultaneously with the long arm of European colonization. So what is required to do this kind of scholarship in an ethical way that neither lets Europe off the hook for a colonial past nor allots it too much power and how we understand either the past or the present. And then finally, this is the question that I am the most interested in right now. And if anybody has thoughts about it, I would love to hear them. Um, how to overcome the limitations of the geographical and temporal frames that organize our disciplinary norms. And anybody who works on Africa feels this particularly acutely because its exclusion from these frames was explicit and it was intentional. It was not simply a byproduct of Eurocentrism. So what would need to happen? Either intellectually in terms of the theoretical frames that scholars use, disciplinarily in terms of the methods we rely on or institutionally in terms of things like publishing practices or the contours of scholarly organizations in order to make this kind of work possible. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for an absolutely riveting talk. Um, you just pause for a moment to let people's applause emojis fill your screen and um, give people a chance to, to catch their breath and start typing questions or raising a hand. Right. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat uh, to be read out by myself or Nish, or you can raise your hand uh, and then you'll be invited to unmute yourself. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen if that's okay, because I have yeah. too many things going on here and can't see the chat. So. Right. Uh, okay, I think Soren is just confirming uh, Kathy Alubi said, which is that your work is mind blowing and this is fantastic, which I think we can all agree with. Thank you. Uh, Although in between those comments, my mom actually privately messaged me bravo. So I'm just going to assume that Soren's finger was actually pointing to the bravo for my mom. Hi, <laughs> mom. Nish, <laughs> uh, reminding us that Rebecca's book will appear soon from UVA. Its title is African Impressions, How African Worldviews Shape the British Geographical Imagination Across the Early Enlightenment. Are there any questions that I'm not seeing? Oh, wait, I've got a hand. Um, Mary Beth Harris, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I have gotten here, this project sort of developed over the course of our time in graduate school together. I have many questions about transformed dolphins, but I'm going to um, focus on, I, I hope this maybe speaks to some of the questions you're asking, which is part of your project that in some ways we have held African imaginings or impressions to a much different kind of literary standard than our sort of European or especially British narratives. You talk about how we assume that the imaginative therefore is like so removed from like the reality that it can't be treated as like faithful or in some ways important it seems that you imply as a depiction of Africa. And so I was wondering if you could tease out 
what you see a little bit more about that. Like, have we held African impressions to much more empirical or empiricist kinds of standards in a way that has limited our ability to have meaningful discourse about these spaces or traditions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say yes. And I would say that one of those ways is that there is this pressure on African discourses to, um, like they're freighted with the weight of needing to be authentic because it feels like they need to kind of speak on behalf of an entire culture, or it feels like they need to speak in a way that it is in and of itself ethical. Um, so one of the things that I have become increasingly interested in as I was doing this project was the ways that, for example, you know, the Swahili, um, discourses of talking about Zimbabwe, that was not the way that the Shona would talk about Zimbabwe, who were the people who actually built that space. You know, it's their own kind of imaginative discourse. Um, there would be kind of a reluctance to engage with that because it's not representing some sort of like cultural authenticity. So in that sense, I think that um, African discourses are definitely held to a, a different kind of standard from what it is that we would expect a European discourse to do, or how it is that we could expect a European narrative to be read, um, how it could work on these kind of like symbolic ways and symbolic registers. Does that answer your question, or at least answer it in, in one way? Feel free to type into the chat uh, if you have questions or raise your hand. I really would love to hear people's thoughts or maybe even just people's experiences themselves with trying to fit work into kind of like time frames that don't seem to fall into to, to traditional periodization. At one point I had joked that, you know, I settled on the term early enlightenment kind of uncomfortably because of its, um, you know, all of the political associations of that term enlightenment. But, you know, for some reason, the late early modern period and first half of the long 18th century wasn't going to fly as part of the subtitle. Marketing department shot that down. Um, so it seems to be kind of like a, a common problem that I hear people talking about, but um, nobody seems to have come up with a solution to. Bethany, would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, and you can. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you. Sure. Cool. Great. Um, so, Rebecca, great talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk more um, about the Queen of Sheba and like what other. It seems like you're you're tracing of that through the different traditions was really great. Um, when I saw the title of your talk, I thought of King Solomon's Mines, the wonderfully problematic Victorian novel, um, and just yeah, is Sheba um, or uh, Makeda? How else is she coming up in your work? More things you could say about her because she sounds awesome. Yeah, well, it's interesting because she is a figure that's kind of fought over by these different kinds of traditions, right? That East Africans are not the only people who lay claim to her. Um, part of these debates are, you know, some folks are making the case that she hailed from East Africa and other people are making the case that she hailed from Arabia. Um, and they're kind of like duking it out over whose local testimony is the most persuasive and the most plausible. One of the things that I find so striking about her from uh, the the kind of like the way that the Ethiopian narrative tells the story of her is just how much kind of like agency it gives her, how much clout it gives her, how much it downplays the kind of specter of, of sexual impropriety um, that tends to haunt her and other kinds of representational traditions and then does become part of Ryder Hag H. Ryder Haggard's representation of her later in the 19th century um, and really does kind of reframe her as this figure who's the central character in the narrative. And she's going there to test Solomon and see if he's as smart as she's heard that he is and she's kind of besting him at every turn um, in the way that that story ultimately gets, cold, gets told. Um, and then, of course, by the time you get to King Solomon's Mines, you know, you have this, this narrative be kind of re-represented in such a way that that segment of East Africa, that something like um, Ortelius's map shows or that um, Paradise Lost sketches out is literally being represented as Sheba's body. And you have the explorers that are kind of like going up between Sheba's breasts and penetrating this like interior region where they're, you know, scraping out all of these diamonds. Um, that being said, just because you brought up King Solomon's Mines, I didn't have um, room to talk about this in the talk, but you do start to get a shift in how this impression is working by the time that you get to something like King Solomon's Mines. Um, H. Ryder Haggard himself said, 
by the time the Europeans actually got to investigate the ruins and by the time that um, archaeology was starting to become a kind of more formalized practice, that the locals, that their testimony wasn't reliable in any way. And he zeroed in on the Zulus and said, you know, they don't have enough sophistication to even understand what this is. So you do get a real shift in the way that African expressions are being epistemologically weighted, but these still totally persist in the literary imagination. If you think about the, you know, spatial grammar of that book, but also the impetus for motivating the plot forward, it's it's still very deeply rooted in this impression that you can see sort of sketched out and laid out in these earlier works. So I think that it carries on. Uh, um, it just changes shape. Always a problematic good time. Yes, so <laughs> true. <laughs> and we have a two part question from Kathy Luby in the chat. Um, regarding your last question, Rebecca, about disciplinary norms and how to do this work. I wonder if you're considering working past periodization or conceiving of periodization differently moving forward. This might be an obvious question, but how does periodization impede the kind of reorientation your work performs? Like, do we need to dispense with the temporal parameters drawn by how our field defines itself? And if so, how radically? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's also a version of the question that I'm asking. I'm always torn in two directions when faced with these kinds of questions. There's the very practical piece of me that says, you know, all knowledge needs to be organized in some way. And those organizational structures are always going to be necessarily limited. And if you want to communicate things to people, you know, you have to work within what is like already agreed upon knowledge. Um, and then the other piece of me wants to say, this is absolutely the problem. And again, as I said, um, the like, philosophical and historical warrant for why we think about the history the way that it does really was built up on excluding Africa from counting as part of that, which is part of why, you know, it seems so inconceivable to imagine how it is that it might fit into the narrative or fit into the discourse in any way. Um, I will say that I think a first step is to come up with it, it get more of a sense of sort of like these temporal frames or periodization are kind of like soft temporary boundaries that you're putting around something in order to think through an issue in a particular kind of way. And that's not a more legitimate way of doing it than maybe framing things um, from a different kind of angle. So I think about whether or not, um, I think about like black study scholars, for instance, who are taking contemporary um, critical race theory or what have you, reading it back onto the 18th century and then getting accused of being anachronistic. Um, there is an example of where sort of like the historicizing is considered to epistemologically trump this other way of doing things. And so I would love to see people be able to kind of like hold both of those ideas in their heads, understand that they have different philosophical warrants um, and justifications and sort of see what that yields. And then you can kind of like try to, to reconcile the conclusions of that, but um, you know, don't use periodization as something that's going to like cut a line of inquiry off the pass. So that's my kind of off, that that's where my thinking is uh, about that right now. And Kathy says, absolutely, critical race theory and historicism should be compatible. Thank you for that great answer. Thank you for the great question. So I'll jump in although I've, I've been struggling to formulate this question and i haven't quite managed to get there yet so bear with me um as you know rebecca one of the things that i um struggle with in my own thinking about our, our period and its works is um why realism and why are we always fetishizing it um and I, you know and i i think the the um the question of you know quote unquote formally realist versus imaginative Literature has really, uh, you know, sometimes uh, led our field down, um, you know, less fruitful pathways. But um, I think that that question becomes sort of trebly freighted when um, you're not talking about strictly European literature. Although, you know, one of the arguments that that you're making, I find really exciting, which is that you know, what is strictly European literature? That's not a thing, right? Um, so you know, something that you and I have worked on together is this weird desire to see Daniel Defoe, who never set foot near Africa, as like this weirdly like like an African savant. Like he he just knew things about the people and the cartography and the, you know, the the location of rivers and lakes that he couldn't possibly have known. And of course the the answer put around in the 19th century is well he must have known a Portuguese person who told him that. You know, not he must have known an African person who told him that, but you know, a Portuguese, which and not that Defoe could read Portuguese. Portuguese, but whatever. Um, but the, the thing that 
you know, kind of always brings me up short is, is why is Defoe always valued for a certain kind of realism, which as, you know, scholars like Lucinda Cole have pointed out is, is not realistic. His Africa is a place with no mosquitoes and no fevers and no live elephants and no monkeys. Um, anyone who had ever, you know, even, even talked to someone who had been to Africa, who had read about Africa in the newspaper knows that's not true. Um, and yet there's this mode that's received as realistic when it's errant fantasy, right? And then there is, you know, actual information that is at least authentic in origin that is consistently recoded as fantasy when it's not. Um, and like, and again, like I'm searching for the question here, but like, I, I don't know how to pull those two things together, but I do think that they're two sides of the same problem. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a bit. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I will complicate it a little bit by saying, you know, I think that there, there are two things. And then I think that there's also this third thing in there that doesn't always get talked about. So when people are talking about the kind of like, especially with geographical discourse and how it shows up in fiction, um, people will tend to do this kind of realism fantasy split and how it is that they're imagining things. And realism is always associated with empiricism and fantasy is always associated with the kind of like monstrous or, you know, like the, the cerebral psychological, whatever. And in fact, I mean, African impressions really fall into this third category of um of like ways of thinking about the world they weren't considered to be fancy they weren't considered to be fantasy but they also weren't empirically determined um they were grounded in the discursive they were grounded in these erudite geographical traditions um they're not like governed by the kind of empirical stylistically empirical discourse that we associate with realism um, but they nevertheless have this kind of epistemological weight and people like recognized it as such and responded to it as such. And so in Defoe's case in particular, actually, I argue in the book in my chapter on Defoe that one of the things that doesn't always get paid ample attention to um, is that Defoe was actually really in careful dialogue with these pre-existing ideas about Africa and that he's revising them in very particular kinds of self-conscious ways. So he's actually taking this kind of erudite geographical tradition and he's revising it into these empirical terms. So if it has ways that it overlaps in strikingly, you know, if it's strikingly, you know, resonant with the way that we think about African geography now, it's because that knowledge was in circulation in one form. I mean, he stylistically repackages it and it makes it look like he has this kind of insight that actually he didn't necessarily have. And of course, there's a lot that he misrepresents, as you're pointing out as well. Um, and the purpose to which he does that, I think, is is um, maybe more complex too than, than people tend to assume. So I, I get into that a little bit in the book as well. But yeah, thank you for that question. I really think that tending to think about the things on that kind of like fabulous and um, empirical binary is part of what's getting in the way of being able to paint our idea of literary style with a with a broader brush or a more in a more nuanced way. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then it, Elaine has added. I'm now reading Elaine's words from the chat. But, um, has added to the chat that the prose poetry divide is part of this as well. I think, and I agree with her. I also think. Um, you know, if we could chart out your next couple of books, um, there's, there's do. <laughs> uh, probably something going on between sort of the the written versus the um, kind of theatrical representation um, where different kinds of realism are valued differently. Um, and, you know, by theat theatrical or performed, right, which are, are different things, but overlapping things. Yeah. And the layering of things that just because something's metaphorical doesn't mean it's not also true. Right. And that, that, you know, you don't have to, to decide it's either this or that. It, it can serve both purposes and be realistic or have some epistemological truth, but also be serving for a metaphorical or a spiritual or something, you know, and, 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 and. I mean, the accretion of 18th century literature, I think, is really useful here because everything's working really hard. Yeah, and just dovetailing really quickly back to Mary Beth's question, a lot of the um, way that African expressions got interpreted had to do with performance, and a lot of the ways that they're traceable has to do with the kind of like repetition of performance, you know, these, these are discourses that can be assembled outside of the European archive because of that repetition of performance. Um, it is sort of like not a mimetic representation of an African reality necessarily, but it's very real in terms of giving you a kind of like insight into how people understood themselves. And it had very material impact on how history played out. Fantastic. I think we have time for one last question from Brett. Brett, would you like to unmute yourself? 
Thanks. Uh, and thanks, Rebecca. This was this was really, you know, exciting and stimulating for a bunch of different reasons um, to me and I think to all of us. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, we were talking about these um, methodological kinds of questions, right? Um, is it is it possible or have you drawn on or would you do a, have a provisional hypothesis for whether some of these ways of seeing ways of knowing that you're reading out of the kind of African self representation different kinds of African culture self representation is that similar to do you feel it is similar to indigenous America indigenous American self representation. Um, a, you know, Arabian and Islamic self representation, East Asian representation, these other kinds of major places that where history is unfolding all throughout our period where we tend to treat them as 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 Eurocentric, but I know a, a lot of I've been kind of getting more interested in early American context for a while, and a lot of the scholars I admire who work on these questions have been particularly interested in making, I think, a similar move to what you are doing too, which is to make sure that these indigenous ways of representing the world, indigenous ways of representing themselves to the world, never get treated as kind of mysticism or 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 kind of um, um, empiric either either too imp too empirical or too mystical, and I, I just I I wonder if if um, either you have made that connection yourself, or if you can see yourself making that connection, or if I am making a mistake in making that connection. But uh, because you've thought about these things more methodologically than I ever have, I was wondering what you thought about that potential nexus. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So I, I, I want to preface my question by saying that I have learned so much and like so many doors were open to me by reading Indigenous Studies scholarship. Um, and so many doors were open to me in reading, um, you know, scholarship on African diaspora, sort of reclaiming the experiences of diasporic Africans as well. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of overlaps and similarities in terms of methods that you can bring to the table. Um, I think that there are probably similarities in terms of the way that the mechanisms of geographical writing and the production of knowledge about you know, all of these spaces were probably very similar. Um, that cycle of discursive reiteration, I'm sure, probably happened in places other than Africa. I will say one thing that does make Africa kind of unique on that front is just how long it went on. You know, I mean, the, the history of, of attempts to represent the new world are just so much shorter than the history of attempts to represent Africa. And then the interesting thing about Asia is that geographies will often categorize it as, an, as a known geography in a way that they won't categorize Africa. And I think it probably has a lot to do with a, a more kind of robust or recognizable written tradition um, that's being funneled from Asia into Europe. Um, so that, it, you know, Africa's kind of caught in that position of having been known about for such a long time and then also having this feeling that very little was known about it. So methodologically, I felt like I actually had significantly more to pull from. And I had significantly more to pull from this kind of like recognized as like legitimate, authentic historical evidence and in, in delving into these kind of like um, African studies realms. So that worked to my advantage. I mean, then of course you have the kind of Christianity Islam overlap that I'm working with as well. And so there are certain kinds of like connections and overlaps that I could make that put me in a more advantageous position and being able to bridge some of these gaps than people who are working with similar questions um, with indigenous Americans. But yeah, absolutely. That's something that I wanna keep teasing out. What is kind of universally applicable? What needs to be very carefully kind of situated with any given local context? Thank you so much. Our time is officially up and I know it, it's a um, busy time of day and it was lunchtime or tea time. So can we just uh, close by uh, flooding the screens again with emojis of appreciation and joy um, or the chat with um, expressions of, of your, our appreciation for Professor Mitzsein and um, her wonderful paper. A reminder that we are back next month uh, on the Bristol uh, platform to hear Dustin Stewart's paper. Um, and I really hope to see many of you there again. Thank you for this wonderfully welcoming and invigorating community. And I look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody coming and your great questions. <laughs>